I mean, heart failure is, a, is becoming a global problem now. A lot of, uh, there's, the estimates have suggested that there would be about eight, more than eight million by 2030. And with growing problems with heart failure, and we have a different um, types of patients with heart failure, one with heart failure with redu reduced ejection fraction, and then heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now, in the years, we have made remarkable progress in making uh, in uh, treating heart failure with reduced EF, whether with, re with reference to advanced versus in the medical management or use of device-based therapies or more so heart transplantation. The growing problem is that you know heart failure with preserved EF, also with regards to morbidity and the mortality, is pretty much comparable to heart failure with reduced EF. Unfortunately, despite all these studies that we have done in heart failure with reduced, uh, preserved EF, there has been um, there has not been a good trial that actually has been supportive of um, of the of any good medications that would allow the improve the patient care by reducing the morbidity or the mortality. I, want, I started looking at to see if the heart failure hospitalization that is noted in uh, reduction in the heart failure hospitalization that is noted in the top care trial, if I could replicate the findings in heart failure with preserved EF. Because the important thing is like, you know, if, if, the, if the analysis, the results of the tests are positive. For example, if I were to find that in my patient population where I did the analysis, if the, if the results were positive that there was a reduction in the heart failure hospitalization, that teaches me something about, okay, something really we have to learn that the findings, what we found in the randomized trial here, I'm able to replicate in, in the clinical world. Now, what factors could have led to that? And why did I see this only in this trial and not in the earlier analysis? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole idea is to understand the gaps in the clinical knowledge about the results what we find in the randomized trial to the results what we are noting in the observational analysis and to see what we can do to reduce the, reduce the gaps in, a, in, a, in an effort to provide a, a reasonable information to the physicians, practicing physicians, in an effort to care for these patients on a day-to-day. -day. So it all depends on what is the etiology of the heart failure. Now, uh, despite all the um, results and things uh, and, um, that's noted in the randomized trials or observational trials, spironolactone is most frequently prescribed medication. One, because, of the, because it's a guideline recommendation from the society, because, and, not, and the recommendation comes through a large literature of evidence and with the supporting benefit in reducing the endpoint, primary endpoints in the patient. Now, um, whether if it's in, if you were to ask me, if it comes down to heart failure with preserved EF, how commonly it's used? I don't know the answer to that. I think that would be very important to understand going forward how people, in most of the practice patterns uh, going through my training, I would recognize that we often tend to see the positive benefit. If we were to note any positive benefits, at least the initial psychological or initial, it, as a physician, we, we attempt to start treating the medication with that, start dealing with patient with those medications because there has been a benefit. Then we recognize some problem and we take a step back again and reanalyze. Uh, but it's, it's a good medicine, commonly prescribed, especially in settings of patients who have hypokalemia and they also have heart failure. And, but obviously the use of the medication is also limited by their comorbid, what sort of comorbid clinical condition the patient have, especially in settings of advanced kidney disease or if borderline potassium levels with the risk of, uh, risk as mentioned because of acute renal failure or hyperkalemia leading to major catastrophes. My primary findings is that there was no uh, reduction in heart failure hospitalization when I did a propensity matching analysis of uh, using role of spironolactone in patients with heart failure with preserved EF, by which I included LBEF of greater than 45%, as was included in most preserved heart failure preserved EF trials. And I've noted there was no reduction in heart failure hospitalization and also in the all-cause hospitalization. And for further, 
I looked at it in with 30 days, one year, uh, one year, and also long as long as four years, and there was no benefit in at, in all three levels. The, the first analysis of using 30-day uh, is done because 30-day readmission is one of the CMS criteria uh, in causing, uh, like, you know, reducing the, um, their main goal is to reduce this 30-day readmission. So I want, I want to see if there is a benefit in that. And sometimes, because sometimes long-term benefits of either one year or four, uh, one year or either two years or four years, might not be clinically evident or it's hard to really un uh, get the results of that because sometimes you know we don't know that we don't have the data where the patient actually if there was a change in the dosage of the medication or if there was if the patient had stopped and then it, he was restarted because once you stop the medicine for some time and you restart it then the effects can be biased about like the results might be confounded so uh, but the and that's the 30 day readmission to uh, to see if there is a reduction in that and also going in top care trial looked at analyzed the patients about three and a half years so we went all the way as four years to see if there would be a benefit that was noted in, in the top care trial and we did not find any benefit now having said that there have been other trials especially in heart failure preserved ef where there are some specific indices of diastolic function that has shown some benefit like spironolactone had some benefit in specific uh, indices of diastolic function based on some soft studies on the echocardiography analysis now so and also we, there is there is there is unequivocally there is no doubt that there, there is some benefit to spironolactone even reducing cardiac fibrosis and uh, de uh, in also in the reducing the uh, uh, accentuation of the diastolic dysfunction and things like that. So I believe that there is a benefit with the medicine, but the, how this benefit actually translates to the heart clinical outcomes. Reduction of the diastolic, if I stop diastolic dysfunction, how does that translate from the heart failure perspective? Because they are two separate, they are within a group, within a spectrum, but they're different group. When it comes to heart failure with reduced EF, the Professional Society guideline recommendation about the role of spironolactone in either NYG functional class two, class three, and class four patients is um, there is no question that they have a beneficial effect. But as I said, uh, there needs to be a very careful consideration of applying the results of the randomized trial in the uh, in the um, society guideline recommendations in a careful manner choosing the right patient population to really replicate those findings. I think that is the important thing is choosing the right patient. And, and at the same time, with, with regards to the heart failure with preserved EF, although most uh, experts uh, agree the fact that the findings of the top care trial have been neutral, and despite some, some benefit noted in the postdoc analysis, of the heart failure with uh, postdoc analysis and also some regional variations in the data, uh, whether it's come, because there has been much more benefit noted in the Americans when compared to the European group. I, at, at this time, we, I believe that there needs to be a lot more work that needs to be done in this area, as I am hopeful that most experts also agree with that. But if your patient, um, meets um, not the study criteria but in the sense like if your patient um, you believe because you're taking care of the patient uh, that your patient would benefit from that from the medicine whether it comes down to treating high, if they're hypokalemic and you instead of replacing with potassium if you want to give a spironolactone a close monitoring which you know, it although I recognize that it might be challenging to monitor exactly as the way we monitor in the randomized trials, but at least uh, with the guidelines, some of the guidelines also recommend about checking uh, potassium. We do a very good job in checking potassium level before we initiate the medicine. But what we face the challenge is to check the levels of the potassium levels or renal function at least a week after or a couple of weeks after. And that could be from a lot of factors. So that's the important thing is careful monitoring in, and at the same time choosing the right patient would, would, 
would, uh, I would hope that there would be a good benefit with this medicine. Mm -hmm. But uh, at this time, there's not much enough evidence to strongly provide a, a level of recommendation to use of this medicine in heart failure with ODF. And I'm hoping that future, in future, we'll be able to understand the benefits that we already noted from each trials and use those and then have a design a clinical trial that will allow us to replicate this, um, to provide us a substantial information about role of this medicine.